Today I want to talk about proposal builder separation, give some updates. In a sense, these are updates because it's something we've been working on uh, for some time. I am the team lead of the Robust Incentives Group, which is a research team at the Ethereum Foundation, looking at mechanism design, uh, game theory, economic modeling, this fancy stuff. In the previous episode, let me set a bit of context for what PBS is. Something we definitely have learned to appreciate more in the last years as block space got scarce and as gas fees got more expensive is that we're all learning what block space is capable to do. So when we think of it uh, as an economic good, we try to understand what its properties are, how to sell it and how to provide for it as the protocol. So as the Ethereum protocol. We know that it's valuable. It's the raw material that users uh, take advantage of to do their transactions, but we know also that some of it is more valuable than the rest. For instance, being first to do something or being right behind another transaction, all these things that we call now MEV. That led us to block wars. I'm just going to read from the text here. While the resistance hashtags take from home, solo validators are rookies in a market of galactic proportions. To keep up with the empire, rebels source blocks from distant planets, but the trade is fraught with difficulties. Indeed, because block space is so valuable and because some people got so good at providing it, it has happened even before proof of stake and proof of work, that parts of the block would be constructed by people who have a specific expertise in making the best use of a valuable block space. So we call that MEV GEF. This was uh, provided by Flashbots and in this MEV GEF network, uh, searchers, who are these very sophisticated players, uh, submit bundles to, at the time, what were trusted block producers, essentially mining pools uh, who were producing the blocks. So these bundles, they are very valuable, but at the time that the searchers submit them, they don't want anyone to see them because the, val the value of a block could easily be copied by a malicious block producer, which is why uh, the network relied on only trusted block producers. When the block producers receive the bundles, they're scored, they're maybe combined with one another. Essentially, you're trying to get the most juice out of the scarce block space that you are providing as a block producer. So how does that look today in proof of stake? It looks very empty because I'll add more to it. But today, you have essentially two options. There could be more in the future. You could decide to forego this smart network of capable uh, block builders and build your block locally, just grabbing transactions uh, from your local mempool. So in proof of stake, the, con the clients are divided in two. There's the consensus client and the execution engine. You're just listening passively to user transactions and including them into your block. Or you can summon this much more complex external network that involves uh, many parties. So let's talk a bit about them. I'll go from right to left, as I feel this is probably the more intuitive way to go about it. So users send their transaction, they are public, they are broadcasted around the network. The searchers pick up some of these transactions and make these valuable bundles. They forward these bundles to builders, and builders are responsible for making whole blocks. And these whole blocks are then forwarded to relays. And the relays act as middlemen in this market between proposers who are the bonded validators in proof of stake and builders. Why we need this intermediary is again because these opportunities that searchers found, they're kind of private. And so we don't want to reveal them too soon to the block producer. We need to make sure that we have a commitment that the block producer will use the block provided to them by the builder before the block is actually revealed publicly. So the relay is this custodian in this system. MevBoost is a little piece of software that you can run next to your node so that you talk to this network of relays. And once the relay says, I have a very juicy block for you, if you use it, I will pay you a certain amount of if, uh, you sign that block or you sign that block header as a, as a block proposal via this builder API. A bit more detail on, on this. 
we can really separate it in, in three phases. The first phase is the bidding phase, where the builders send their full blocks to the relays. The relays have to validate that the block is valid, that there's no consensus error, uh, and that indeed the bid that the builder declares uh, corresponds to the value of the block. In the second phase, the bid selection, the proposer listens to these streams of bids from the relays. By default, today, MEVBOOST selects the highest bid that the proposer has received. And at that time, the proposer signs the bid with the builder API, and they can no longer make another block. They, they don't know the full content of their block, but if they were to make another block themselves, now they would have signed two different objects, and they could be slashed for it. In the third phase, uh, the relay receives the signed bid from the proposer, and at this stage, it's confident that it can release the block to the rest of the network, and there's not going to be uh, a copy that is being made. A few numbers that I got from a few days ago, uh, more and more validators seem to choose to use this external block building facility, which today leaves pretty much totally out of the protocol. 50% uh, as of, uh, I think that was Saturday. Flashbot, Flashbots still operate uh, the dominant relay, so 83% of the blocks which are received and signed by proposers have been relayed by Flashbots. And there seems to be seven uh, active relays, some of them are all run by the, the same entity and they, let's say, satisfy different trade-offs uh, that the block proposers may have when they want to, to summon this uh, external network. So what is PBS? This was sort of an intro. In what I described before, you can think of this as PBS. PBS is more of a philosophy, so it's proposer-builder separation, and it's the idea that as the protocol gets more complex and as the roles of pro block proposers uh, become more valuable, it may not be possible for the block proposer to do everything. And so parts of what the block proposer does uh, could be outsourced to, to third parties outside of the protocol. These days, I think of PBS as kind of two different things that we've maybe wrongly uh, put together. So I call it the proposer builder separation, separation. On the first uh, side, I think of PBS as a market structure or a way of or organizing uh, the duties of the proposer with respect to the protocol. So again, there are duties that the block proposer, especially the average block proposer who's taking from home, can't or, or won't do. So for instance, making this execution block that contains the valuable block space. Uh, in the future, making dunk sharding blocks, which will contain a lot of data and require very high bandwidth to, to propagate. Maybe even further f into the future, once we have statelessness, uh, computing the block witness, if we want stateless block proposers, that might not be possible for them. And even further, uh, we might require validity proofs along with the uh, execution block to show that um, the execution is correct. So that would rely on enshrining some ZK EVM into the, into the protocol. And so it seems to me that the protocol is becoming more and more complex, is asking more and more things to the, to the proposer. And so maybe it's a good idea to think of ways that we can organize these markets. The second half of the separation is, is not really the organizing principle, but it's really the shape of the market. So I think of the first half a bit as the legal system. It defines who are the players. And the second half is more of a business logic. What exactly is being sold? And what are the contracts that the proposer enters into with these third parties? Today for PBS, when it comes to the execution block and block space, the allocation mechanism is a whole block auction. So the proposer sells off their entire rights uh, to make a block. The current design allocates the right to make the exact block to such a third party, as we've seen uh, in MEVBOOST. Being a bit more precise about it, MEVBOOST, the allocation mechanism again is this whole block auction. And the market structure of MEVBOOST places the relays as kind of brokers who broker these deals between the proposer and between the builders. A relay, they, we expect them to, to guarantee the validity of a good, but they're not protocol actors, and they could fail. These are a few ways that they could fail. For instance, they could receive a block from a builder and fail to properly validate that it's a valid block. This has happened before. A relay could also um, not validate properly that the bid made by the builder actually corresponds to what is being paid um, to the proposer. And it could also fail midway into the deal and, for instance, deliver the block late or not at all, in which case the proposer doesn't have the opportunity to, to propose the block themselves and misses out on some of the rewards. So this is kind of the idea of in-protocol PBS. 
is moving this systemic part of the, of the system into the protocol. So in, in the in-protocol PBS design, the protocol becomes the broker, and it's the one that guarantees that if deals go south, um, the proposer is still compensated for it. So the builder in this case, uh, whenever they make a bid, that bid is binding, even if they deliver an invalid block or if they don't deliver it at all. They would have to pay the proposer up to the bid that they have made. So a bit more detail on this. Again, we can use the same um, framework or, or division to, to understand this market. In the bidding phase, the builders send directly the bid to the proposer. Uh, for instance, there's a couple here, five, seven, eight, if. At the bid selection phase, which is slot one, the proposer selects a bid and makes a beacon block that commits to the bid, which you can see in green below. So seeing this, once the proposer makes a bid, so this is part of a consensus rule, whenever the proposer makes a block, you have a row of attesters, which is a very large set of, of stakers who vote to say we've seen this block and this block should belong to the chain. So these attesters, they give weight to the beacon block and they make safe the block in a way that the builder sees it and the builder says, well, there's no real way for the proposer to go back on their commitment to my bid now. And so I feel confident that I can release my block and it's not going to be reverted and stolen. That's slot two. At the delivery stage, the builder releases the builder block that contains the, the payload. And once again, you have a row of attesters that makes uh, the builder block safe. Right now, what I described is really a vanilla version of in-protocol PBS. But of course, you may, as a proposer, your only value may not be you just want to maximize the amount of EVE that you get. And you might want to add some constraints over the block that is being made so that you don't entirely uh, remove your input from the block production. One way to do so is inclusion list. So an inclusion list is a list of transactions that the block builder must either include or show that they couldn't include in the block that they made. And the only way that they can't include the transaction is if the block is full. So if you're trying to keep a transaction away from a block over, let's say, a long period of time, it becomes increasingly difficult to do so and expensive. And the reason is EIP-1559. In Ethereum today, if a block is full, the protocol mandated base price increasing exponentially over time. So if you want to keep censoring something, you have to keep making full blocks and it becomes just impossibly expensive to, to do so. And so that's the idea behind um, inclusion lists. Another way to do it is to just let the proposer make part of a block. So for instance, they could do the prefix or the suffix and they could let the builder build the rest of the block. Designs exist for both sides. Uh, if the proposer makes the prefix, the builder will make the suffix and vice versa. So that's another way to reintroduce a bit of proposer input uh, into the block construction. A third variant of, of PBS is the slot auction. So I didn't really specify what the bids were, but there are two versions. In one version, the builder has to commit to a certain block before they make the bid. And in this version, the, the builder doesn't have to commit. They're just saying, at, when the time comes, I will make a block for you and, and you can just select me because I will pay you the most. And so this might be more flexible, especially when it comes to things like uh, cross-domain MEV, which require you to do things just in time. So we have these three variants. Uh, they are not incompatible with one another. Uh, it's just a matter of deciding you know, the trade-offs and, and what fits well uh, into the protocol. And even for each variant, I think there's a bit more, um, a bit more margin for us or a bit more parameters that we can tune. So if we do a partial block auction, we can decide which part. If we do inclusion list, you have some leeway on deciding who makes the inclusion list and when. And if you auction the slot, you can even tell yourself that you know, the slot could be auctioned much more in advance than just the current uh, block. So I've been trying to think maybe adversarially with respect to this uh, PBS proposal. And, and tell myself, well, if PBS is really two things, a market structure and an allocation mechanism, could we enshrine into protocol only the market structure and let people determine um, the allocation mechanism that they prefer? So this is a proposal I recently posted on EF Research, but it's, it's very new, so I won't talk about it today. Okay, I want to pull out the frame a bit and, and, and look ahead to what might a world with PBS look like. So the first question that I guess we ask ourselves a lot as protocol designers is, 
putting things into protocol is really hard. And if we do that and then people don't use it, there's not really the use for all this overhead. And so the first question, which I think is natural, is would, if we had this in protocol PBS, would proposer use it? Um, one reason why they might not want to is because they could still strike deals of chain with builders and get the builder blocks included, even though they receive bids on some kind of official uh, gossip channel for the bids. There's another proposal which is called MEV smoothing. It's a mechanism that takes the block value and smooths it across all the stakers in the protocol rather than giving it only to the current block producer. That would make it binding because it would force proposers to accept the highest bid received on this official uh, bid channel. But there's more questions there in terms of incentive compatibility that I think we need to, to look at. Another question is would relays still exist? I've been talking about this official bid channel. There's questions on how to design that. But it could still be the case that proposer would listen to out of protocol bids that come from relays that they prefer. So for instance, relays might be very good at get getting you the, the best bid very fast in time, or they might um, be constraining the bids, for instance, with censorship. So as a proposer, if there are transactions you don't want to include, you could listen to, to some relays that, that provide you bids uh, with respect to that. Some builders may even prefer to use MevBoost since they don't need to put the upfront capital, but it's to the proposer's risk in that case. Pulling a little bit more, what does the protocol see? This is a question we asked ourselves when we introduced EIP 1559, and the answer was, well, it prices the congestion in the network, it prices the value that the next person who isn't included uh, would be ready to pay uh, to get included. And as we add more of these economic mechanisms in the protocol, we find that the protocol gets more introspection about what happens and the value that people using the protocol get out of it. And so one reasonable question is, what does the PBS bid uh, value exactly? And I think ideally, that bid should be the total extractable value that the proposer's position confers um, to the proposer. But is it? In reality, does the PB, will the PBS bid really represent this extractable value? Can it be achieved with a single builder? Can it be achieved with a distributed builder? There's more models, I think, that we can uh, work out on this. Another way to think about it is, might the PBS bid be the spot price of value for the block? For instance, if there's economic value from selling the rights way in advance before your slot so that people can plan for it and possibly make promises in advance, uh, with the PBS bid, we are not really capturing that. Or is there economic value to selling rights to multiple builders at the same time? So uh, these are, I think, very interesting questions with respect to, to PBS. Pulling the frame even larger, and especially in this um, world where more and more of these proposer duties are performed by third parties or by builders, is where should the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum as a protocol, where should the concern stop? So we could decide that, you know, if proposers don't want to do the things that they are told to do by the protocol, and if they want to enter into these third party relationships, well, the protocol can't prevent them from doing so, but doesn't have to actively help them either. So for instance, we could keep including more things into the builder API at the client level, just so that the communication can happen between the proposers and these third parties, but call it a day and let the out of protocol uh, markets develop there. We could decide to draw the boundary a little further. So this is the distinction I was making. We could decide to say, well, the protocol should guarantee some kind of market structure for the proposers because that makes them safe and it backstops certain bad cases, for instance, relay failure, uh, but it doesn't have to determine all the mechanisms. So my Pepsi proposal is in that direction. And then we could also decide that, well, all the markets that the protocol uh, requires for these third party relationships, they should be determined at protocol level and we should be able to find the best way for these markets to, to organize. I, at the moment, I'm, I think I'm still exploring all options and I think we all are, uh, but as the protocol ossifies, it might be more and more difficult to say for sure that we got it right the first time around and that it's still right uh, 50 years later. Some incomplete ways uh, to think about it. I think these are really the criteria that help us decide between these questions. And the first is, what is the risk for the protocol? So if, if there is a very systemic uh, dependency on this third party relationship, 
does that put the protocol safety, liveness, or throughput properties uh, in jeopardy? When we do things at protocol level, does it maximize welfare? So for instance, increasing capacity, serving more user transactions, that's a no-brainer for sure. This gets us more value into the system, as long as, of course, safety and liveness uh, are preserved. So, so these things are good. This is maybe a hot take, but I've been seeing, well, MevBoost, you are selling off your whole rights. Maybe we should go back to a world where uh, proposers have to make the block themselves. But I'm not making this argument entirely either. I think sometimes outsourcing things to third parties, it might be good. There might be much more incentive alignment when the third party really wants uh, something to go into the, into the protocol. So there's also that uh, to weigh in the scale. And the final thing that we might consider is the risk for the proposer themselves. So should the, should the protocol uh, backstop uh, possibly risky behavior uh, that the proposer engages in? So yeah, I'm asking more questions uh, than I have answers for, but this is also what I think interesting in the, in the research. I'm not alone in asking these questions. There's going to be much more talks about PBS at DEF CON, and I definitely uh, encourage you to, to check some of these out. And if you think these are interesting questions, I would also like to invite you to apply uh, to our research team, as we are currently looking for someone with a strong research background, who knows mechanism design and, and really loves it, and wants to help us make sense of all of it. Thank you for your time.